Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Continue in our study of the book of Acts. We're in the middle of chapter 16. We've seen Paul and Silas, Dr. Luke and Timothy, they're in Philippi. They've been meeting with, with the women out by the river since apparently there was no synagogue in Philippi. Lydia was one of those women who was saved along with her entire house. And then Lydia asked Paul and the team to stay at her place in Philippi, which became the base of operations as they were planting a church there. Things seemed to be going along pretty good in Philippi for Paul and the team, and then they're confronted by this demonic-possessed girl who was showing some sorts of, of demonic possession and prophesying, and she was kind of a sideshow attraction for her owner. She was a slave girl, and she was making money for her owners. But when she saw Paul and the team, she said that they were servants of the Most High God. Eventually, Paul got tired of this demonic voice following him around and saying this. While it was true, it became a real distraction. And he ordered the demon to come out of the girl. And of course, then all her prophecy stopped. All of her ability stopped. She no longer was a sideshow, which meant she was no longer making money for the, the, her owners. The owners then had Paul and Silas thrown into jail, beaten and locked up in the inner, inner portion of the jail in stocks after having been beaten. We're working through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is beginning the journey. The title of my message this morning is God Works, even in difficult times. Even when you think it's not good, God's still working. So let's dig into our text this morning and see why God has recorded and preserved this narrative for us. Beginning in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I wonder what this scene was like. If you've ever been in a jail, if you have, I don't want to know it, but if you've ever been in a jail, they're noisy, stinky, and uncomfortable, and that's a modern jail. I can't imagine what it would be like to be in a, in a Roman jail where prisoners had no rights and they didn't have all of the modern conveniences that we have now. Think of iron and cement block, iron and rock, no air conditioning, no running water, a, a can for a toilet or the floor, whatever, and so forth. Just imagine what that was like. Now you're in the inner most cell of that. We saw last week that they, didn't, they were afraid that they would escape or that they would be released. So they put them in the innermost cell. So it's a cell within a cell within a cell, a cell kind of configuration. I wonder what the scene was like as Paul and Silas, who had been beaten with rods, remember, you know, one or two inch wide strips of wood lashed across your back. They were then physically secured to stocks, either on the wall or on the floor or both. Guards all around, and there Paul and Silas were singing hymns. I think it's, I think it's important for us to see what, Paul, what Dr. Luke says here. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. Singing hymns what is is not they they weren't singing old rugged cross and so forth what they were singing when when we see that in in ancient near east literature it typically means that this was like what we would call today a creed it was theological statements set to music so you could re remember them remember they didn't have youtube and and uh 
what, what's the other, TikTok and all that kind of stuff, so we can remember how things go. You know, I'm always looking up old songs because I can't remember how they go. They had to just remember them, and so they set theology and doctrine to music. And so Paul and Silas were there giving a theology lesson to the prisoners, and they were listening. I think they were praying out for the delivery of the other prisoners and the jailers from Satan to Christ. They weren't praying, oh, condemn these guys that beat us. They weren't praying for their own delivery. They were praying for the delivery of the people around them. So there they are singing the gospel and praying for the people around them. Dr. Luke doesn't tell us they were complaining or that they were resenting what was going on. The grammar of Dr. Luke's statements indicates that this was not the case of the prisoners just listening, but more like listening with personal interest. They were interested in what's being said. The prisoners were not just in a jail. You can't help but hear what goes on everywhere. And that's not what Dr. Luke is saying. They were actually paying attention. They were listening to hear what was being sung and prayed. It was the middle of the night, and yet they were interested in what was being said. Here's your first question. Does the fact that the prisoners were listening with personal indi interest indicate anything to you? What does it mean when Dr. Luke says they were listening with personal interest? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. They weren't shouting out and yelling out quiet. They weren't shouting out at to be quiet, true. God had pricked their hearts to open them up. That's exactly right. It tells me that the Holy Spirit was active in the prison that night. The Holy Spirit was working on the hearts of the prisoners, and we'll find out the jailers. We know that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, there's no interest in seeking God. We as fallen human beings have no interest in finding God. That's why I, this seeker-sensitive movement is cuckoo. Nobody seeks after God unless God draws them. And that's what was happening in the, in the jail that night. They were singing theology songs and they were praying for the people there and the people were listening because the Holy Spirit had touched the heart of those prisoners and people. The Holy Spirit was drawing the prisoners and jailers to God through the songs and prayers of Paul and Silas, even in the middle of the night. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison's prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. God causes an earthquake to happen. But I think more than just an earthquake. I think Dr. Luke is looking for words to describe the shaking of the building. But we don't have record of a big earthquake going on. And we don't have a crumbling of structures. What we had is some rumbling and gates and bars and doors opened up. Luke doesn't tell us of any damage. He just tells us their stocks and shackles and doors were opened. Clearly. A demonstration of God intervening in what's going on. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The third time in the book of Acts, Dr. Luke has recorded a prison break, or potential prison break. This one's different. All the prisoners were still in their cells. All the doors and the stocks were open, but all the prisoners remained there. The Holy Spirit was doing more than influencing the prisoners to listen to the singing and praying. The Holy Spirit was doing way more. The Holy Spirit directed the prisoners to remain in their cells, to remain where they, ha where they were, to forego their opportunity 
to escape. The jailer who was responsible for the entire jail must have lived with his family close by. Some suppose that he lived in an apartment above. When I started my law enforcement career in Kosciuszko County, Indiana, the sheriff and his wife lived in the jail. She was the matron. She cooked the food for the, for the prisoners and so forth. That's a cuckoo job right there, but that's not an uncommon thing. If you've ever done any research on Alcatraz, you'll know that the guards for Alcatraz lived on the island with the prisoners. Their families lived there with them. There was a school. There was a grade school, one through eight, on, on the island of Alcatraz. How'd you like to have that job? Talking about a supportive wife. Oof. That would be nuts, right? When the earthquake occurred, the jailer saw the gates and the bars and the stocks and the doors open. Well, that's it. Everybody's gone. If all the gates are open and all the bars are, are open and the stocks are open, he assumed everyone else was gone. What I find interesting is that the other guards of the prison are not mentioned. He was not the only one. We know there were guards around Paul and Silas. I suspect that when the, when the earthquake began to rumble and the bars started to open, the jailers fled. Because they didn't want to be attacked by the prisoners. Remember, prisoners didn't have rights. And so they got abused a lot. And so a jailer didn't ever want to be in a situation where there was a couple of prisoners and only one jailer. So if the bars are going to be open, if the gates are going to be open, I'm out of here. And so they fled. There certainly were other guards around, but they didn't, they're not mentioned anymore. Roman law demanded a, a life, the life of the guards that allowed a prisoner to escape. Imagine that. You wouldn't want to take a job as a correctional officer if an escape meant you died. I know a few correctional officers that have lost a prisoner or two, and I would not want to go to their funerals, but that was the way it was in the Roman military. So the jailers left. The chief jailer is looking at this and going, all the bars are open, all the guards are gone. I'm just going to cut to the chase. I'm just going to kill myself. I'm going to take out my I'm going to take myself out so that I don't have to suffer through all of this of what's going to happen. Roman law demanded his death and rather than go through the suffering and the build up to the execution he was about to kill himself. Then something no one expected to happen happened. Paul shouts out, don't do it, we're all here. Now, as I read this, I'm thinking, how does Paul know what's happening? If in fact the jailer lived on the second floor or above or around, he's at home with his babies and his wife, and he's going to kill himself, how does Paul know? I think the only plausible answer to that question is the Holy Spirit was providing Paul all the intel that he needed. The Holy Spirit was telling Paul, here, it's what you got to say. The, the lead jailer is about to kill himself. The warden's about to kill himself. Tell him not to. I don't know how the Holy Spirit told Paul that. I don't know if the Holy Spirit went up to him. Hey, Paul, say this. Or if he just impressed that on his mind, like we have interaction with the Holy Spirit. I don't know what it was. But Paul knew what was happening and responded to the inform information given to him. You know, i got to ask you a question on this. What principle do you see here? What principle is here as the Apostle Paul responded to the Holy Spirit? Okay, Paul's immediate obedience. God working to save those he wants saved. Very good, yes. 
Others? We, we need to love those, even those who stand against us. I see more than one principle here. First, there is the principle that God works through every situation to accomplish his plan. God is the sovereign creator, sustainer of the universe, and he's orchestrated every event of nature to free every person in the prison. He then influenced every prisoner to remain in their cell. The prisoners wanted to get out of there. They, there wasn't a, a national communication crime information center, NCIC, that they could put alerts out if the guy has escaped. There was no way to tell if you really are who, who had escaped. So if you escaped, you could go free. They had no way to prove you were who, who you were. So they were looking for ways to do that. But they didn't. They didn't leave. God then provided Paul with the information to thwart a suicide. God works in every situation to accomplish his goals. Even the things that happen to you that are ugly or bad. Second is the principle that God doesn't react to events, but plans for the events. This was not a surprise to God. This was all part of God's plan. I would submit part of God's plan from when he created, before he created, when he chose. When he chose that Philippian jailer to be saved, he also put into the plan, and here's how it's going to happen. God was working in Philippi through Lydia and Paul's team, and God orchestrated the arrest of Paul and Silas so they'd be in a position to bring the gospel to the prisoners. God provided an earthquake to shake things up, and the prisoners from escaping so that Paul would have an opportunity to lead the, the lead jailer and his family to Jesus. And I suspect others came to Jesus that night too. God didn't react to the situation. God was the situation. God's not responding to the things in our world. He is the things in the world. He's the one doing it. I would submit that God through the ages has never been reactionary but always has been planning the events of history, big and small, to bring glory to him ultimately. We just got to see a little more of these details of this event. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear and fell down before Paul and Silas. This verse is kind of interesting to me. I don't know if the lead jailer did not believe that what Paul had told him. I don't know if, if when Paul yells out, don't do it, we're all here, if he didn't believe it. Or if he just needed to get right face to face with Paul. I don't know what was going on in his mind at the time. But he got a light in the middle of the night, rushed in, and fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and you and your household. I love this. The jailer goes right to the cell of Paul and Silas, falls at their, free, at their feet, and then brings them out to ask them a question. What I got to do to be saved? That's a great question. I love it when people ask that question. What do I have to do to be saved? The Holy Spirit was working on his heart. The Holy Spirit had orchestrated all these events so that they were there at that moment with the Apostle Paul and Silas to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? I suspect the jailer had heard the singing. He'd heard some of the gospel message in the songs. He'd heard the prayer of, the, of Paul and Silas. As Paul and Silas prayed out loud, I suspect they prayed for the salvation of the people in Philippi. So the jailer had a natural question. What must I do to be saved? Again, this is the work of the Holy Spirit leading him through the process as well as leading Paul through the process. 
He's orchestrating both sides of the event to bring them together at that moment where Paul has the answer to the question the the jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? Holy Spirit works both in the person to be saved and in the person leading him to salvation. That's why I asked the question earlier when, when we were talking about our gathering opportunities. What are we doing with the opportunities? Paul could have said, hey, listen, we, you want to take care of these wounds on my back? I'm a Roman citizen, and you beat me, and you locked me up against the law. You want to take care of my back? No, Paul was listening to the Holy Spirit and said, here's what you need to do to be saved. Paul's answer was short, clear, and proper. But his answer also gives us some theological conundrums, some things that we have to understand. Paul said to the jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Then why does he tack on this next phrase? And your household. That just muddies everything up. You need to separate some parts of what's being said. We'll deal with the final phrase in a little bit. Let's focus on believe. The word believe is the Greek word pistousason, which means to trust him, to have faith in, confidence in, dependence on. It has the root Greek word of pistis, which is used to speak of the body of doctrine and theology believed about God. So what Paul was telling the jailer is that it's way more than simply believing Jesus was a man, even a good man. It's not just believing those things. The real gospel message is that we are to depend on God to save us. Not just believe there is a God, not just believe that Jesus died, but to depend on him to do what he said that he was going to do and to save us. It's no different than the, than the Jews when they brought their sacrifices. Their sacrifices did not save them, even for a second. They always had to depend on God to save them. Salvation has always been by faith. Never by works. The real gospel message is not just belief, but dependence on God. It's a trust in God. It's a reliance on God doing what he said he was going to do. And as we discussed in Sunday school, he's immutable. He can't not do what he said he was going to do. That should give us great comfort. Our salvation is dependent on God having the legal authority to forgive us. I've talked about this before. God had this, this problem within himself. He, his, his righteousness and his holiness demanded justice for sinners. So he couldn't just forgive us. But his grace and mercy created a way for the perfect sacrifice to pay the price for us. Our salvation is dependent on him forgiving us. He gave himself the legal authority to forgive us by the death of us on the cross. He will forgive us and he'll give us eternal life despite our sins. The gospel message was the same for the jailer as it is for all of us today. The same as it has been for every person in history. Dependence on God. Trust in Him. Now the last phrase of verse 31 is a little more difficult to comprehend. When Paul said to the jailer, you must, you and your household, he was not telling the jailer that his salvation would then carry down to the family. It's not a headship salvation. There are those that argue that. They say because of Adam plunging us into sin, that the head of the family can then remove us from sin. That's not true. That's not even close to being true. Here's where you really need to pay attention to the 
context of what is being said. I said earlier that the Holy Spirit was providing Paul with information about what's going on. He was telling Paul, who didn't see the, the, the jailer, who didn't see all the people in their cells, but the Holy Spirit was telling him, listen, they're all here. Tell the jailer, don't kill himself, we're all here. I think the Holy Spirit was also telling Paul that the jailer's family was also being called drawn. Look, look at verse 32. That gives us a little more insight into it. And they, and they, that's Paul and Silas, spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So Paul says to the jailer, here's what you need to be say, do to be saved, you and all your house. And in the next verse, Dr. Luke records that they gave the gospel again to, to the jailer and to all that were in their house. The Holy Spirit said, listen, there's more than just the jailer at stake here. Talk to them all. Dr. Luke recorded that Paul knew beforehand that the entire family would be saved and then showed how it happened. Nothing in this text would lead us to properly conclude that the jailer's faith was sufficient for himself and the family. It's never that way. It's always individual based upon our trust of God. So here's another question for you. What does verse 32 tell us about the presentation of of the gospel. I'll put verse 32 back up for you. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. What's that tell us about the presentation of the gospel? Everybody? Okay. We've got to present to everybody? Okay. What else? In this age of Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, 140 characters and all that kind of stuff, a lot of people think they're spreading the gospel by having some pithy saying on a bumper sticker on their car or a Facebook post that has butterflies and God will bless you. And That's not the gospel. That's not how you present the gospel. I, I don't know of anybody that was ever saved through faith, Facebook. It's a personal thing. Have have to have face uh, face to face contact. Well, it, wasn't written down it wasn't written down for them yet, right? So what what we see is Paul explained to people the doctrine of salvation, and that's what doctrine, uh, Brian. Soteriology. Thank you very much. Soteriology. The doctrine of salvation. You have to explain to people. You can't just say, God loves you. That's not sufficient. You can't just say, well, have a blessed day. That's not sufficient. Bumper stickers and Facebook posts and tweets are not sufficient to spread the gospel. They may be warm and fuzzy, but they don't spread the gospel. It's explaining the word of God to people who the Holy Spirit has prepared to receive it. That's what our evangelism is. That's what the spread of the gospel is. And, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Paul and Silas explained the gospel to the jailer and his family. Here's what it means to be saved. Here's how you get saved. Here's who Jesus is. All of that. They were saved. They, they depended on him. There was an immediate change of heart of the jailer. Now think about what had happened in the previous hours. Paul and Silas were arrested. They were beaten. They were thrown into the innermost cell and they were locked in stocks. Nothing was treated on their back. 
No comfort was given. No care was taken. They were basically abused and locked in a hole. As soon as the jailer becomes a follower of Jesus, he takes them out and he begins to treat their wounds. He begins the process of healing their backs. There was an immediate change of direction for the jailer. That is dependent on the Holy Spirit working in the heart. It's not part of how to be saved. It's a conclusion of being saved. When God saves us, we need to be different than when we went in. Otherwise, what is salvation? Paul, then, Paul and team then baptized the entire family. I don't know where. I don't know what kind of water was around. We need to recognize that the prisoners weren't treated as human beings. They had no rights. So as the jailer goes out and begins to care for his wounds, he's demonstrating a true conversion. In doing so, placed the jailer in significant jeopardy. He no longer could be trusted to handle prisoners. The jail was opened up. Nobody escaped, but there he was in his house caring for his prisoners. He could no longer be trusted. I must also point out that the baptism of the jailer and his family was post-salvation and not a means to salvation. No grace is ever conveyed by baptism. Baptism is what we do as a demonstration of our salvation. According to the Didache, an early, early church manual of procedure, baptisms were in the form of triune immersion. We don't know what water was used. We don't know where they went. I suspect there was a, uh, a pool somewhere, not for, not for uh, relaxation, but probably a water cistern type pool. We need to just assume that it was large enough for at least the jailer and his family one at a time to get into to be immersed. The Didache written in the first century makes it very clear. Triune immersion is how they baptized. There is some debate whether they, they went in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. There are baptismal uh, pools in some early 1st, 2nd, 3rd century churches that are in the shape of a cross. And so you did it. Each, each immersion was done in a different stage of the cross, but they, had, they, they were immersed three times. You saw one of those? It's very cool the way those fonts are, are made. And the jailer then brought him up into the house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed on <coughs> God. So understand the scene here. Beaten and locked up without treatment, Paul and Silas didn't escape when given the opportunity. Rather than escape, they presented the gospel to the jailer and his family, leading them to the Lord. The jailer then demonstrated his change of heart and treated their wounds. And then the jailer was led into the waters of baptism. The jailer brought Paul and Silas into his own house and fed them. He violated so many rules for the prison. But he was more concerned about Paul and Silas than he was himself. I suspect he was not thinking about his job going forward, but was concerned about how to repay these two men that had led them to salvation. I'd like you to think for a moment about the range of emotions the jailer had gone through that night. Just a little while earlier, he was ready to commit suicide. And now he's rejoicing with his family, believing in God. The word rejoice is much deeper and fuller than we see it in English. It's the Greek word Egaliasato. In Greek, it has so much more weight than the English word. He wasn't just happy. You can picture him jumping around with joy, even shouting excitement over what God had done. Think about a 
two and a half year old on Christmas morning. And then magnify that a hundredfold. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Dr. Luke lets us know that all the events of the previous verses took place in the same evening. So we have this, this earthquake and, and almscape and salvations and baptisms and, and treating on the back. All of that happens during that one night. What a busy night, right? An emotion up and down roller coaster night. The lead jailer is given information. The, 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 the representatives, the police of the magistrates come and say, hey, the magistrates want to let you guys go. Let, let those guys go. So the jailer gets that information. And he goes to Paul and Silas and says, they want to let you go. He could then continue to feed and care for them as well as continue to have them in his house. This was a good thing. He was happy about this, or at least probably should have been. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? Nuh-uh. Let them, go, let them come themselves and take us out. I love the Apostle Paul. He was willing to suffer for the gospel and for serving the Lord. But he was not willing to let the government get away with breaking their own law to work against the gospel. Notice that Dr. Luke records that Paul was not talking to the jailer who, had just been, who, who he had just led to the Lord. Notice that Dr. Luke records Paul said to them. That's the cops that came to give the notice. You go back and you tell your bosses that they locked us up illegally. Legally, they violated their own law. You tell them to come here and let us out themselves. Now, I want you to know that's some chutzpah. That maybe even some crazy chutzpah. When the jailer told Paul that they were to be released, Paul must have demanded a face-to-face -face with the police. He basically tells them since Roman law had been violated to put them there, the people that violated are going to have to come out and talk to him face-to-face. They couldn't hide underneath their underlings. You ordered the rest? Stand up like men and come down to release us. Paul wanted to make sure the truth of the incident was made public. I find that fascinating. He could have just gone. But he didn't. So, you know, there's another question. Why do you think Paul waited so long to make his Roman citizenship known? Let's say that again. Yeah, if he'd been let out earlier, none of those things would have transpired. It was all God's time. Paul could have avoided the arrest. He could have avoided the beating. I kind of would have wanted to do that. He could have avoided the incarceration being locked up in a smelly jail. I suspect the Holy Spirit was telling him to wait. Just let this play out. Don't say anything. I think the Holy Spirit led Paul in telling the lead jailer not to harm himself since all the prisoners were there. It's no stretch the Holy Spirit was telling him that it wasn't time to announce he was a Roman citizen. The events of the night probably wouldn't have happened had he announced it from the beginning. When, they, when the magistrates went to lay hands on him, he said, hey, don't touch me, I'm a Roman. Remember, Philippi was a Roman colony. And as a Roman colony, the people in it who are citizens had the same rights as people walking down the street of Rome. And you just couldn't put the habeas gravis on people. You had to have warrants to do that. You had to do things in a legal manner, which is not what the magistrates had done. Paul was following the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so the, the police go back and report these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. I bet they were. 
So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So the police take the message back to the, to the magistrates. Hey, boss, do you know they're Romans? Do you know what kind of trick bag we're in now? There was a terrible consequence for violating Roman citizens. But we also need to give the magistrates some credit here because they did go back and apologize. Of course, that was self-serving credit, right? They went back and apologized so that Paul and Barnabas wouldn't go after them. Paul was not angry in his demand for an apology. He was not belligerent. He had a plan. He had a reason for doing what he was doing. And I don't think he did it for himself. I think Paul understood the new church in Philippi needed to have a clean reputation. See, it wasn't associated with a synagogue. It wasn't associated with anything else yet. It was in a, it was in a city that had, had restricted worship. We talked about that last week, the arch that was outside, a mile outside the city, the boundary line of where you couldn't do anything except for, for the Roman gods. And I think Paul understood that in Philippi, the new church needed to have a clean reputation. People needed to understand the violation was all the government. The violation was not Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy. The violation was all the government. The church is clear here. The church is clean. It was important for the church to have a clean start. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Paul and Silas left the prison. I suspect there were more conversations with the jailer. Perhaps the jailer came with Paul and Silas as, he went, as they went back to Lydia's house, their base of operations where the church was meeting. Maybe the jailer was introduced to the church at that time. As a new believer, he would need to fellowship with them and study with them, learn and to grow. Paul and Silas encouraged the church before they left. Here's a little side note. I'm not going to charge you extra for this. The word in verse 39, apologize to, and the word encouraged in verse 40, the same word. In Greek, it's the same word. Parakel esen, which has a wide range of meanings. From call to one side, that's the idea of paraclete. That's the idea of what the Holy Spirit does for us. He comes alongside of us and supports us. To appeal to, to urge, to exhort, to encourage, to comfort, to cheer up, to be friendly. All of those meanings are in that word. And I think Dr. Luke uses the same words so that we understand deeper what's going on in this early church. What's going on in Philippi. There was a desire to see God work through the people in Philippi and to see God's word be given. And so they were encouraged. They drew them. Yes, sir. Probably. The jailer probably was because of his job. Lydia probably was because she was wealthy. So probably, because it was a Roman colony, most of the people would be citizens. And so they would all know these rules. And setting the story straight of what happened, clearing the name of the church was an important thing to do. Paul and Silas had been arrested, beaten, locked into stocks and the innermost cell without any treatment for their injuries. Yet they were praying and singing doctrine songs. The fact that Dr. Luke records they were singing hymns indicates that they were singing, that their singing was actually church creeds and doctrinal statements. These creeds and doctrinal statements were often set to music to make them easy to remember and to recite. I mean, why do we teach kids the ABCs with singing the ABC song? So you can remember your ABCs. As they sang the gospel and prayed out loud for the salvation of those in prison, the prisoners heard them and actively listened. 
The Holy Spirit was actively working in the hearts of prisoners in the lead jailer. God placed Paul and Silas in a very difficult situation that caused them great physical pain and harm. But through this situation, the jailer and his entire family were led to the Lord. As, and I suspect many others in the prison were as well, as well as in Philippi. The church in Philippi was blessed to see the Lord work in such a dramatic way. The church was planted with very, very firm, sure roots in a strategic city in the empire. Paul didn't just go to any city. He went to cities that were strategic in the spread of the gospel. When God sends us somewhere or places us somewhere to serve him, we should recognize that he also prepares people around us to hear the message. God never sends us out without preparing the way. Unless he's sending you out for practice, which sometimes he does, God is preparing the way for you. Just like John the baptizer prepared the way for Jesus. God, through the Holy Spirit, is preparing the way for you to talk to folks. When you present the gospel at the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has already prepared the heart to hear it. They may not accept. They may not. It may take years, but they've been prepared to hear it. And when it's people that are going to accept, God has brought them to that place expressly so you can lead them to the Lord. Doesn't mean we'll always see salvations when we talk to people. I've talked to people for years. And I wasn't present when they were saved, only to find out years later they were saved because the Holy Spirit was working through my voice. Another principle I see here is that the size of the congregation doesn't determine the mighty work that can do a location. This was a brand new baby church without all of the infrastructure that a synagogue would bring. But they got to witness a great event as salvation came to the jailer and his family. They were baptized and added to the church what a start for that church. God can and does do amazing things with small congregations in small churches. We've seen, seen the same thing in our own congregation. God has worked in mighty ways through this church to see men and women come to know him, even in places we've never been. There are people that know the Lord because in, in Central African Republic because... We've been involved. There are people in Cambodia. There are people in France. There's people in, in churches in all sorts of lands, even lands we're not allowed to talk about, that have come to know the Lord because we've been involved. But that doesn't mean we get to now just rest on what God has done. I'm really proud of Brian's initiative to remind us every week to call, to call us to, to tell us about who we're gathering, who we're working on. I'm proud of the work that many of you do in trying to gather people. We can't stop gathering. We can't stop trying to evangelize. The Holy Spirit goes before you and prepares the way. Be confident in knowing that you have the voice to say what needs to be said. Don't be afraid to try to gather people. Don't be afraid to try to lead people to Jesus. I guarantee you, if you've never led anyone to Jesus, the first day you'll do it, you'll be hooked. It'll be the best day of your life. So give it a try. I'm proud of Brian for bringing that initiative up and reminding us every week, who are you trying to gather? What are you doing to gather them? Are you just relying on the bumper stickers and Facebook posts? Are you actually involved? Father, thank you. Thank you for the truth of this picture that Dr. Luke paints for us here. The picture of salvation coming to the jailer. The fact that Paul and Silas were, were listening to the direction of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was preparing the way. 
and the jailer and his family were saved, demonstrated by their immediate change of heart as they began to care for Paul and Silas, as they were baptized, as they became part of the church family there. Remind us, Father, to to listen to the Holy Spirit, to listen to the direction we're to go, to do everything you want us to do. Remind us to be mindful of those around us that need to hear the gospel. Teach us how to do that. Give us the courage and the comfort to do that. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Give us a great week this week, and let us be involved in the lives of others and see men and women, boys and girls, for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.